you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, I'm Tricia Patrick. I'm the Chief Academic Officer at the Westchester Institute for Human Development, or WID. Uh, as you may know, uh, WID provides healthcare support and other services to people with disabilities and their families, as well as to vulnerable children. Uh, we also uh, work under the Center on Disability and Health, which resides at New York Medical College's School of Health Sciences and Practice. And it's under that center that we're bringing to you the presentation this evening entitled, A Dozen Ways to Enhance Quality of Care for Patients with Disabilities. So our presenters will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. As you can see, I'm recording this session, but I will turn off the recording during the question and answer session for confidentiality reasons. Um, at that time, even if you don't have any questions, please hang on. I'm gonna just launch a quick poll, two questions. It's just some feedback on the presentation this evening, uh, and we really appreciate you providing that information. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to our moderators, Karen Millman and Mariella Adam. Thank you both. Hi, everyone. I'm Mariela Adams. I'm a faculty member for the LEND program at WIHC. I'm here alongside Karen Millman, who's also a faculty member. And more importantly, we have our presenters. Um, they are all self-advocates from New York State. Uh, they all participate in the speakers program, which is a program that we have at WIHC that uh, prepares self-advocates to share their stories and their lived experiences. And uh, I'll let them sort of introduce themselves throughout the presentation. So I'm going to share the presentation and they'll take off. I'm going to turn to meet them. All right, whenever you're ready, Nicole. Okay, my name is Nicole Hastings. I am a middle-aged woman. I'm very athletic. I live on my own. I'm part of the LEND program through WID, um, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about how important medical is to me and others with disabilities. We are knowledgeable patients. Let us be part of the team. And what I mean by that statement is even if you're meeting us for the first time and I give you an example or what might be going on with me, like I suffer from anxiety and different um, issues when I go into a mental um, medical facility. So um, if I tell you, you know, you need to go a little bit fast, because I'm in a men medical facility and it's going to create anxiety for me. Don't assume, assume I'm diagnosing myself. I'm just giving you that history so that I don't have to go through procedures and medical treatments that are unnecessary. We want to feel that we are in knowledgeable hands when we are re receiving medical care. For example, I had a medical procedure two years ago and I had to go in alone because it was during the middle of when the COVID pandemic broke out and I had to go under anesthesia for emergency sur surgery. And the anesthesiologist and the medical staff said to me, transfer over on to the operating table. And I looked at them with six heads and said, how do you expect me to do that when I cannot move from cerebral palsy? So I had to literally tell them how to physically move me from point A to point B. And also once I was on the operating ta table, 
have them strap me down because even under anesthesia, because of my spasms, I can move. So for my safety, I had to have them strap me down and tell them how to move me. So even during a medical procedure, we always have to be on our game and be knowledgeable about what's going on around us so no harm comes to us and we can get the medical care that we need and focus on what is going on during that time. Three, this is the most important for me, staying in good health um, requires a team approach. I have um, cerebral palsy with quadriplegia, which requires a team of about, I'm not kidding, about 20 different specialists at one given time. So they all need to know how to work together to give me the best quality of care because I'm very athletic, I'm very independent, and I need them to work together because if they don't, my medication can break down, my medical care can break down, and it can slow me down in my way of life, and that doesn't work for me. Hi, my name is Bobby Terry. I have a cerebral palsy. I use a wheelchair to get around. I used to live in group homes and used to have a lot of people to help me with my medical um, information or medical decisions when it came to seeing doctors or whoever. But now I live on my own and I still have my own supports, circle of supports and stuff. Um, but now that I live on my own, I have to make a lot of those decisions and see a lot of doctors. Um, I still have help when it comes to certain medical appointments, but um, a lot of my supports, some of my supports don't, don't know me as well. Um, as when I lived in group homes, they did. So now, now I have to be able to be able to um, um, have to now sometimes I have to um, tell the doctors to um, that they can talk to me because um, because a lot of my supports don't know me as well as I know myself. Um, when I lived in group homes, there was um, a lot of people that uh, I relied on to help me with when it came to my medical history or when it came to um, uh, when it came to when it came to talking about medications or if it came to having surgery or not, um, a lot of those decisions came down to, even though they would ask me, a lot of those decisions came down to them and it also came down to my parents. Um, the reason why it gets, the reason why it switched is because I wanted to be more independent with, um, as far as living on my own and being able to make a lot of those decisions because I realized I still needed help, but you know what? I can, you know, I can make those decisions on my own with um with um some support. So now now that I've I also went now that I've gone through the gone through um, a program called the supported decision making, which um, which got my rights restored back to me. So now I'm now I'm not under guardianship, 
Um, now I have people on my team that still, still they help me make decisions, but the final decisions of what I want to do with my own medical decisions come down to me. You know, they still give me their opinions, but it all comes down to me. So, talk to us first. We are the patient. Encourage patient to to the best of their ability. And what I what me mean by that is kind of what I was just talking about um, earlier. Um, don't forget that we're in the room, even if somebody is with us, don't forget that we're in the room. We can, we can understand what's going on, even if we can't talk. Uh, a lot of us can understand what's going on. So just don't forget that we're, we're in the room. Like, don't talk to our support person first, talk to us first. Accessibility is more than just ramps and handicapped bathrooms. We need to feel comfortable in phys physical spaces. And what we mean by that is, like for me, example is sometimes I get, if things aren't, if the room isn't where the medical, where the medical appointment is, if the room isn't um, um, big enough or small enough for my, big enough for my wheelchair, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna feel comfortable going there. Or, or if I've, me and myself, I feel claustrophobic or um, something like that happens, then, then I'm gonna wanna move myself to a bigger area so I feel like I have space. So just make sure that the room is accessible to us. We want to be a good, oh, we want to be in good health explain to us your treatment plan and consider how it would af affect our quality of life. And what we mean by that is, um, for example, um, one time I went to a couple medical appointments for, um, cause they, I went to a specialist for something and they were considering giving me major surgery um, which would have really put me, um, took me back, to, back, took me backwards instead of where I wanted to be. Um, so they were really pushing for me to have this surgery and to have, they wanted to put a catheter in and everything, but I didn't feel comfortable doing that. And after talking with my mother, who is also a nurse, so I trust her because I understand what she, I know she understands what she's say, talking about. So after talking with her and going over all the options they were giving us, both of us, um, I decided not not to even not to even do it because it would have the surgery that they wanted to do was put a catheter in and everything like that. And that would have meant I would have needed more help. I wouldn't have been able to live where I'm living now because I would have had to go back to being in a, possibly being in a group home, possibly um, having a lot more assistance, not being as independent, um, not being able to go anywhere without anybody, you know, so it just would have really affected my whole entire life. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Claire, you're up. Oh, 
Oh, Claire, we can't hear you. You're, you're muted. You're on mute, Claire. There she is. Oh, no. Go on. There you go. Okay. There you go. <laughs> All right, you can hear me now? We can, Claire. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Claire Poland. I work at WIAD with the Hear Our Voices organization. I also volunteer with many other organizations. I am not afraid to face challenges. For example, public speaking does not come easy to me, but I do it because I know it will make a difference to other self-advocates and other medical professionals. So without further ado, let's talk about medical care. Being afraid of doctors is not a symptom of any disability. Just because I have CP doesn't mean I can't be afraid, but it also doesn't mean that it's because of my cerebral palsy. Often when I go to doctors, I get what's called white coat syndrome, and they don't understand that it's just pure nerves and they assume that I am unable to speak for myself and they are not listening to me as a patient. They often look to my caregiver for the information because they think I am too nervous. This is not the case. The case is that I am nervous, but I am willing to learn how to be a better advocate if you give me the chance. Next. We know what it's, what it's like to feel good in our body. Believe us when we tell you that we don't feel well on a medication. Oftentimes when I go to a doctor, they assume that I don't know what is going on with my current medication regimen. And they don't know, they assume I don't know what's going on with my current medication regimen. And they think that all they have to do is ask whoever's around me when I know what, it, what it's like to feel bad in my own body. For example, I was once given the wrong medication and I didn't feel well. And I was trying to tell them that I didn't feel well. And even though I was in a different frame of mind, they still should have heard me and maybe talked to my parents, or even tried to communicate with me. So always try to communicate with the patient first. Number nine, we want to feel hopeful on our medical journey. Remember to stop and let us know that we're gonna be okay. This is the most important one for me because I was diagnosed with a mood disorder at 18. It was a very vulnerable and scary time because we didn't know exactly what it was or what was going on. Now I have a new psychiatrist and at one point she simply told me on the phone you will be okay. I will get you through this. Not many doctors take the time to just let us know that it, that it will be okay. Sometimes that can be the difference between your patient feeling bad about their mental health or any health diagnosis or not. Next. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Jesse Millman. I am uh, pursuing my bachelor's degree in uh, finance, and I'm graduating in spring of 2023, which is not a long way. I am a uh, group fitness instructor, 
a uh, Zuma instructor. I'm working at Clarfeld Citizens Group, which is a wealth mm -hmm. management firm in a cherry town of New York. And also working as a, uh, a dance choreographer in my, uh, well, in this case, my local school district, and that is East Chester High School. So the medical, medical experience that I have, the only medical experience that I have was it's a seizure, a seizure disorder. So in this case, um, but so, so to make the story, to make the long story short, in December of 2020, um, I was just feeling like, feel like upset. I feel like a little bit, um, I, just, I just felt like upset and like worried. And I just didn't want to discuss about what was my concern about it. So at work um, in the afternoon, I felt like just, I felt like I was not concentrating on my work. So I just like fell to the ground and I had no idea what, what, what was expected to happen. So by then, uh, one of the, um, the colleagues who used to be a volunteer of the medical field was able to revive me and bring me over to the Westchester Medical Center. <clears throat> and from there, um, some uh, the doctors and nurses did a few exams to investigate what was going on with my system or my body. So, and the results were that I experienced a seizure disorder. So now, um, from this point going forward, I have to uh, just take care of my health when I live with this medical type of condition. So now I'll be sharing you uh, the three tips and that will also evolve, in that will also translate to, or it'll cover some, some uh, tips in regards to when I have a seizure disorder and to help you guys um, work with a patient with disability who may have a, this, that type, this type of condition I have or just some other medical conditions. So for 10, help us be successful patients, be open to accommodations during appointments. So this basically means is you want, uh, like patients would like to have some alternatives, making this appointment really like a comfortable and successful experience because if patients, because the doctors don't give any accommodations or if patients, if doctors cannot, don't give the accommodations, they may feel like really uncomfortable. They may feel discouraged and also just feeling, just feeling terrified about it. So one example I can provide is giving the, the patient to record appointments. Um, in this case, because of this, there may be some patients who have processing issues like I do. So, I would do, so basically I would do is, I would just use the Otter app or just, or any other recording or any recording device. Um, but first I have to make sure, I give the, I have to make sure that the doctor would give me the okay. If that's so, then I will record it. Once it's done, I can just review it. And then uh, once I understand about it, then I can present it to my parents. So I say that a combination is really like a beneficial one. Another one is that um, is to have is to give the patient time to write notes. They may seem they may seem that it's important. So um, so if like and you and what they would do is that they would just write all those notes down, making sure that it's all it's all good to go, and that way I can uh, that way uh, patients can present it as another option. And of course, if they don't understand what's been said. The patient then could just ask the doctor again just to repeat the information and that way they could just write it down and understand the material. Um, another accommodation is giving the patient time to ask any questions, anything that's concerning them. Because um, if they again, if like if they don't understand what this um, what anything has been said, it's important for patients just to like patients to like read, right? So like ask them the question again and basically like clarify it. So that way like it's like kind of a straightforward response and they understand it. So some questions that may be, some questions may involve procedures or anything to do with um, shots or blood tests or anything like that. Um, so in this case, they may ask like some questions about it and this, and then just um, have it out just to clarify it. 
and making sure that it will be a com that making sure the patient will be comfortable. It won't won't be as difficult. They'll just get through with it. So it's important for for patients just to ask the questions. That way, the pa the doctor understands their concern and want to help the patient feel comfortable and successful. And one more combination is being in, have it like a private room. So for example, in my dental experience, when I was young, I used to be like, um, I used to like, uh, well, I've gone to like the second dentist. I'll mention about the first dentist later on. Um, but um, during my dental experience, um, I explained to my pediatric dentist or my parents spoke to pediatric dentist that I had sensory issues. So I had like sensory, like I, had, I, I was in like in the area where I hear like some boisterous sounds or in this case, like loud noises. So what the doctor so the dentist did, which was very, which, which was very generous and very caring was he put me in a room where it's kind of like, where we'll be in a quiet area. And that way I won't hear any drills or, or any other dental work that I hear. So it'll be like in a quiet experience. So that's why I think a private room is also another good combination. So that way patients will feel comfortable in that area and, no, and can get through that dental work without hearing any noises that might that may distract them. So those are the four combinations I can provide. Um, for this, uh, for this tip, learning about an advocate support circle and how they can help them achieve good health. So, having a support circle, it's it's absolutely important because um, because members of the family should absolutely help them and by providing suggestions and strategies on how a patient with a disability can um, continuously to have a long, like a, uh, I would say like a long-term health. And, and it, like, and, and um, just staying in good health and just, 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 just to continue to enjoy what they're doing. So um, for example, um, let's see where my notes are. Okay, yes, yeah, so for example, my mother encouraged me to set alarms to remind me to take medications. And like I said before, I have a seizure disorder. So as far as medications wise, I have to take um, Vimpat. Um, and in this case, I have to take two per day, one in the morning and one in the evening. And I also have to take a vitamin D medication. So one example is uh, my mother encouraged me to set alarms to remind me to take medications because there are times where some patients may forget to take the medications, which is not a good sign. They, they may be like, like, there are times when we were so like regimented with all the activities and all the priorities that we have. So it's important that I just take my medications consistently. So what I would do is I would set alarms. Um, so that way I, that way it would remind me to take my medication, whether it's the morning or the evening. So, and also another strategy is she she uh, she gave me a medicine container organizer. That way, I could sort out the medications for each day of the week. So in this case, just I have to like dot all those I's and cross those T's. So, and uh, she also asked me to look through my medicine container just to check and see how much I have left and what is the best time to refill them, and and to wait not too long. And to, and to wait and to not wait too long. So, and even if I live independently, I will utilize those strategies so that I can live long when taking medications and to prevent me from getting breakthrough seizures. And that can happen if I forget to take my morning and eating medications. And in fact, speaking of the breakthrough seizures, by um January, uh, but by July of 2022, I had like a, a breakthrough seizure, which I didn't expect that was going to happen. And when I look, and uh, what my mother learned when she read the book is that some people, that some breakthrough, breakthrough seizures can happen when 
there was like a lack of, lack of medication in this case when people forgot to take their medication or switching to a generic medication instead of a prescribed one. And my feeling is it, it may have happened when it, it may have happened when I just switched from a generic medication. So other than that, um, um, who is it? So who's involved in my, so who's invested in me in my future was my parents and those who are part of my circle of support. Um, and not only them, but also there could be, but also some others. So for example, after a seizure, my father took me to specialists who would perform um, different exams, maybe such as MRI scans, CAT scans, EEG, which is like, like uh, just to test how my brain's activity is functioning, and some other scans. So, um, and as far as my mother, she reached out to parents that she knew from all the years of the special ed PTA to find the best neurologist that she could find because my mother knew that there are some parents who have children with disabilities with seizure disorders. Um, another example I could provide is the IV procedure. So, um, let's see where it is. Um, oh yeah, so we, one day we've gone to, my, my mother took me to an oral surgeon and he looked at my, my, uh, my teeth, including the wisdom teeth, and noticed that um, I had like the, uh, the cavity on the sides. So it's almost like kind of like an invisible type of teeth. And that type of teeth is like hard to brush them. So the best suggestion was just to remove all four of them. And so at first off, so so when he so he explained three different types of procedures. Uh, one of them was the laughing gas, the second one, which I'm not sure what it was, and then the third one, which he recommended, was the IV procedure. And that type of procedure would be where I would get the anesthesia. So and and uh, so they would do is they would just put me into put me to sleep. And, and then it would just work on the procedure. And then by the time I'm up, it's completely over. So I was, I was still feeling worried that do, work doing this IV procedure was gonna be a little bit, a little bit painful or a little bit scary type of experience. So first off, um, I, I, uh, my, we, my mother spoke to me about the IV procedure. I felt like uh, maybe we should speak to the pediatric dentist and see if that's the best one to choose. So first off, she would speak to him and, and, uh, by, and of course extracting the information. But I was felt like, you know what? As I wanted just to take care of it. So in this case, I advocated myself for by speaking to my pediatric dentist. So from there, I uh, spoke to him and he said, the IV procedure is the best one to choose. So in this case, I was able to uh, get through with it. And now the wisdom teeth are removed, so I feel, to, so I feel absolutely comfortable with no wisdom teeth and can brush the rest of them, the rest of them. So that, so it, so that was an example of that's another example of well the support circle. Um, another one I could I share is um, the worst dental experience. So um, uh, my grandparents were also part of my circle of support. My grandfather joined a group of grandparents of grandchildren who were on the autism spectrum. So it's just as an FYI. Uh, during my first visit to the dentist for a cleaning was the worst experience. I was struggling a lot because like I said before, I had lots of sensory issues. So what he did was, uh, so by five years, so at five years old, my first pediatric dentist tried to open my mouth and started probing. And I was like feeling really uncomfortable just to get through any type of dental procedures. So then she asked two assistants to hold me down and try to work through them. And that's, and I, again, I was like struggling. I was fidgeting. I, I couldn't stand it. So then we tried five to six assistants and still I could, get, could not get through with it. So then my pediatric dentist was like, I can't work with them. I can't do anything about it. So in this case, 
my dad was extremely upset. And he told me that um, we're not going to see that dentist ever again. So my dad spoke to my mother. And my mother told my grandfather, uh, who was a dentist for many years, and he suggested that he suggested to find another dentist. So in this case, um, this case, uh, we we found another dentist. Um, second, um, so um, so yes, yeah, so we so we spoke to like um, my, my parents took me to the second pediatric dentist, um, and she uh, she explained to him the whole scenarios. Well, I have sensory issues, I have autism, and then just some other stuff. And he did was um, just uh, took me to a private room and he, and he shared and he was like, any procedures that we do it, you're gonna, you will, will be all right. And he just, and we did was he took it step by step, did it very, just did it carefully, was very kind, very patient and well-organized. So from that point on, I was able to get through that type of dental procedure, just to, first we did a practice one, and then I was able to do, was able to get through all the dental procedures. So I was very pleased that that doctor was, um, was I could say considered, also considered as my uh, circle of support. And um, and um, I see what else meant, if I miss anything. Um, let's see, uh, I mentioned about that one. And um, let's see, uh, Oh, and the, uh, the seizures, I think I already uh, mentioned about that. And uh, so, yep, yeah, so that for number 12, listening to us is more than just hearing what we have to say. Make it your job to create a disability-friendly medical office. So listening is also, is also important because we want, we want doctors to hear for what the patient's concerns are and knowing like, knowing like what is concerning them. So that way doctors can um, provide suggestions while, while after the question has been presented to them and also like what, the, um, what their concerns are has been presented. So during, so um, again, like we spend time in the office with myself, my parents, it is at the second pediatric dentist. We just, we discuss, uh, we discuss about what my concerns are, and he just took it. Um, again, we just went into a private room, not like in a, like in the, like in a place out in the open, and we just took. We she, he took it step by step. He was patient, kind, well organized, um, and that happened when I was seven years old. And I gotta say, I really enjoyed this pediatric dentist. So now, by the age of twenty eight, believe it or not, I still go there. Because I, because he he utilizes all the key factors that I just mentioned, so I really enjoyed him very much. And not only that, I also have an, a hygienist who also utilizes those key factors. That's like patience, kindness, well organized, and just some other key factors. So in this case, they um, not only do the clinical work, but they also they are gen they generally care about me, which I really really appreciate of. So, and uh, so, and they also just listen to what I have to say, listen to like what I'm doing thus far, um, what are my concerns are. So listening is also another thing that pay, that doctors should use, should use when working with any patient with a disability. So that's all we, that all four of us have to present. So if they want to ask questions, please ask them away. So feel free to unmute yourselves. <laughs>